Okay. Hello. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ava Kadiwada. I'm one of the internal medicine chief residents. For today's Grand Rounds presentation, we are joined by the Longer Life Foundation. I would like to start off by introducing Dr. Dan Zimmerman. Dr. Zimmerman is Global Medical Director at Reinsurance Group of America and Managing Director of the Longer Life Foundation. Dr. Zimmerman. Good morning and welcome to Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. As noted by Dr. Kadi Wada, I am Dr. Dan Zimmerman and I lead the Longer Life Foundation, which is a collaboration between Washington University and Reinsurance Group of America based here in Chesterfield. Now in its 22nd year, the Longer Life Foundation's mission is to fund and support the study of factors that either predict the mortality and morbidity of select populations or influence improvements in longevity, health, and wellness. Since 1998, we have funded over 125 research grants here at WashU. Today, we will be hearing from Dr. Stephen O, oh, a former Longer Life Foundation grant recipient. I'd also like to take this opportunity to recognize our recently announced 2020-21 grant recipients. They are Dr. Cynthia Herrick, Dr. Alex Holhaus, Dr. Devesha Kulkarni, Dr. Catherine Lindley, Dr. Bettina Mittendorfer, and Dr. Jeffrey Henderson. With that, I would like to turn things over to Dr. Dominic Reeds, Associate Professor of Medicine, and Medical Director, Nutrition Support Service at Barnes Jewish Hospital. Dr. Reeds also serves as Director of the Longer Life Foundation's Longer Life Center here on WashU campus. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks very much, Dan. We uh -huh. are fortunate enough this morning to have uh, Stephen O talking to us today about uh, updates in the biology and treatment of myeloproliferative neoplasms. As Dr. Zimmerman noted, Stephen was a uh, prior recipient of an LLF award. He has a somewhat checkered academic history with a uh, undergraduate degree from, I believe it's pronounced Harvard University, followed by an MD PhD from Northwestern and then internal medicine residency and fellowship at um, Stanford prior to um, coming here. In addition to being a fabulous scientist, Stephen is very entertaining and uh, uh, educational speaker. So I look forward to a fantastic talk this morning. Thanks very much. All right, thanks Dominic. Uh, not sure about the checkered part, but I'll, I'll take it. Uh, welcome everyone and thank you for coming. And uh, Today, I, I'm going to provide an update for you on, on the field of the myeloproliferative neoplasms and tell you a little bit about the research we've been doing in this field, both in the laboratory and in the clinic. And uh, for those of you that are social media inclined, you can follow me on Twitter at Hi, everyone. It seems that we're experiencing a little bit of technical difficulty. Um, I think that Dr. O may have gotten booted out. We'll give it uh, a little bit of time here to see if we can get him back on with us. Thank you for your patience with this. <laughs> 
So start at the beginning. Uh, okay, my disclosures and learning objectives, they're on the screen for you to see. So I'll just go ahead and skip through that. So uh, I'd like to start with a case. So we have a 73 year old man who complains of fatigue, night sweats, early satiety and poor appetite and a 10 to 15 pound weight loss over the past few months. Uh, his spleen is enlarged about 14 centimeters below the left costal margin. And you can see his CBC there showing leukocytosis, white count 18, anemia, hemoglobin 9.4, platelet count 113. His uh, differential shows uh, myeloid immaturity with 2% blast. And uh, here's an example of what it might look like with nucleated red blood cells, uh, teardrop RBCs, and myeloid immaturity, the so-called leukoerythroblastic triad. So he undergoes a bone marrow biopsy, which uh, shows uh, characteristic features of primary myelofibrosis with hypercellularity, megakaryocytic hyperplasia and atypia, and 2 plus reticulin fibrosis. His cytogenetics are normal, and testing for the JAK2V617F mutation is negative, uh, and, but he's positive for a CalR or CalReticulin mutation. So I'm going to just throw out this question here, and, and feel free to enter into the chat if you have uh, ideas on, on which of these treatment options you might choose at this point, and, and I'll go through uh, in my talk what, how I would approach this. So options can include A, hydroxyurea, B, uh, transplant, C, ruxolitinib or another JAK inhibitor, D, clinical trial, E, splenectomy. So I'll give you all a minute uh, if you, again, would like to put your uh, answers into the chat, and uh, we'll come back to this later on. Okay, we have a couple of, of choices for C. So far, we have a consensus <laughs> for C. Okay, why don't we keep going? And feel free to uh, continue to put your, your thoughts in the chat. Okay, so just some background to get us uh, on the same page here for, for myeloproliferative neoplasms or MPNs. So, the 2016 WHO classification, uh, you can see there uh, in this uh, category of MPNs, there are actually a number of different subtypes. Today's talk is gonna focus primarily on these three, polycythemia vera, essential thrombocythemia, and primary myelofibrosis. Um, if anyone has questions about some of these other MPNs, I'm happy to address those as well. Okay, so the MPNs really are a group of diseases that exhibit shared features across a continuum of disease stages. So if you think of polycythemia vera or PV and essential thrombocythemia as ET, PV, of course, the hallmark is too many red blood cells, elevated hemoglobin, ET, too many platelets. Both of these diseases are associated with blood clots or thrombosis. And in both of those cases, there is a risk over time of development of post-PV or post-ET myelofibrosis. Um, and certain patients also can present, like the case I described, as de novo or primary myelofibrosis. And this entity, you know, the hallmark, of course, is underlying bone marrow fibrosis in conjunction with constitutional symptoms, extramedullary hematopoiesis, and splenomegaly. And as I'll talk about uh, in, in detail, the role of inflammatory cytokines is thought to be key in the development of myelofibrosis and really all of the MPNs. Now, patients with myelofibrosis have a risk over time of development of secondary acute myeloid leukemia. And in, in some cases, PV or ET patients will uh, transform directly to AML. In terms of the prognosis for these patients, it is variable depending on the type of MPN. So uh, in, in comparison to uh, age or expected survival, patients with ET have a relatively modest impairment or minimal impairment in overall survival, whereas polycythemia vera, which we think of as quite similar to ET, is actually a little bit worse in terms of the long-term outlook. In, uh, but, but significantly worse than PV or ET is myelofibrosis with an overall median survival of less than six years. Now, the MPNs are thought to originate at the level of hematopoietic stem cell or some early progenitor cell, and they uh, are, their phenotype is really transmitted all throughout the myeloid lineage. And as I'll get into in a little bit, we, we think that actually even uh, the cells that are not harboring the, the malignant mutations in these diseases likely participate in the disease pathogenesis. Uh, 
Now, going back historically to 1951, William Damoshek wrote this editorial speculating on the nature of, of the myeloproliferative diseases. And, and, he, and he wrote that he thought that there was some sort of uh, un undiscovered stimulus that was really promoting the development of these diseases. And this was back in the 1950s, of course, before modern molecular biology. And fast forward to 2005, when the seminal discovery of the JAG2B617F mutation was reported. And this mutation was found to be recurrent in, in cases of polycythemia vera, uh, ET, and myelofibrosis. And this JAK2V617F mutation is an activating mutation which results in hyperactivated signaling through this JAK stat signaling axis. And these stat uh, proteins are transcription factors which upregulate expression of genes involved in proliferation survival. So you can, you can imagine that uh, activation of this cascade results in hyperproliferation in the bone marrow, elevation of blood counts such as what you see in PV and ET. And we, we know that uh, this JAKT mutation is present in actually almost 100% of patients with polycythemia vera, as well as about 50 to 60% of patients with ET and myelofibrosis. There are rare alternative mutations in JAKT2 that can be found in, in selected cases of PV, and then also relatively uncommonly mutations in MIPL, which is the thrombopoietin receptor. These mutations are present in ET and myelofibrosis. So uh, at, at back in, in a decade ago, this is where we stood in terms of understanding the genetic basis of these diseases. And we refer to the uh, about almost 50% of patients with ET and myelofibrosis as being JAK2 negative. And then in 2013, another seminal discovery in this field was the identification of mutations in the cow reticular cow R gene. And these were found actually in the majority of these JAK2 negative ET and myelofibrosis patients. So between JAK2, Cal R, and MIPL, uh, this accounts for the vast majority of patients with ET and myelofibrosis in terms of their primary genetic driver. Uh, and uh, I don't have time to get into the details today, but Cal R mutations also uh, activate JAK stat signaling, as do MIPL mutations. So it's now thought that regardless of whether it's JAK2, Cal R, or MIPL, these mutations again do result in activation of JAK-STAT signaling as being the primary basis for these diseases. Now, this is an obvious target for therapeutic in intervention. So in 2005, when the JAK-2 mutation was first discovered, uh, many different small molecule inhibitors of JAK-2 rapidly went into clinical development. And this led uh, initially to the development of ruxolitinib, which is a JAK-1 and JAK-2 inhibitor. And this is data from the phase three comfort one study, which led to its FDA approval in 2011 for the treatment of myelofibrosis. So in this study, patients with myelofibrosis were randomized to treatment with either ruxolitinib versus placebo. And uh, looking at spleen response, so patients with myelofibrosis often have uh, uh, quite dramatic splenomegaly causing significant symptoms. And so this was used as the primary endpoint in the study, looking at a spleen volume response of at least 35% as the primary endpoint. And each vertical line here is an individual patient. So you can see that with ruxolitinib, uh, virtually every patient had at least some degree of spleen uh, shrinkage and about 40% of patients met that primary endpoint. Whereas with placebo, not only do you not see any uh, decrease in most of the patients, you actually see an increase over time, which is the natural course of this disease. Furthermore, patients treated with ruxolitinib had substantial improvement in symptoms. So we, we now use these validated symptom uh, questionnaires to assess symptomatology in patients with myelofibrosis. They will often have, as I described in the, in the patient present, uh, uh, presentation, uh, night sweats, fatigue, weight loss. These things can be debilitating, and we often see quite substantial improvement with ruxolitinib, to the point that patients, just from the symptom standpoint, will come back to clinic after they've been put on a drug like ruxolitinib and say it's been a miracle drug for them. So the, you know, one of the recurrent questions early in the, in the development of these inhibitors was, well, are, do they only work for patients with a JAK2 mutation? It's a JAK2 inhibitor. Uh, however, as I mentioned, whether it's JAK2, Cal, or Mipple, these patients, all, it's, it's thought that the, the, there is activation of JAK stat signaling regardless of which mutation is present. And so this was actually borne out in the study that even those patients that were JAK2 negative, we did see similar degrees of response in terms of spleen and symptoms. So this drug can be used regardless of the mutation status in patients with myelofibrosis. Now, in terms of clonal response, I, you know, when, when these drugs went into development, there was the hope that this would result in similar kind of effects as what we saw in CML with BCR-ABLE inhibitors, where we can measure uh, molecularly the BCR-ABLE 
uh, translocation down to microscopic levels below 1%, far below 1%, and I expect to achieve that with these small molecule inhibitors. Here, with the JAK2 mutation, what was observed was that there was a decrease in the uh, mutant allele burden, but really only a relatively modest decrease and nowhere down to zero. So we do not see molecular emissions. We do not really think of ruxolitinib or other drugs in this class as being capable of inducing a market clonal response or really modifying the underlying disease in a, in a really truly significant way. Uh, now, despite that, there, there has been observed to be uh, some indication of a survival benefit with ruxolitinib. This is relatively modest and it's been a little bit controversial in terms of, of the statistical analysis. So, uh, you know, in my practice, I don't really use this as the basis for uh, putting a patient on ruxolitinib, but rather focusing on the symptom benefit, which again is quite substantial and meaningful for these patients. So back to our patient. Um, so in, in this case, in a patient like this, I, I would certainly consider the use of ruxolitinib. The patient has symptomatic splenomegaly and constitutional symptoms that are likely to improve with ruxolitinib. So let's say we did that. The patient went on ruxolitinib. It did lead to symptomatic improvement. His spleen decreased substantially and he did well for, for a period of time. But not uncommonly, after some period of time, it could be 18 months as I have described here, or a couple of years, something like that, the patient uh, inevitably will uh, have a recrudescence of symptoms. And over time, cytopenias may get worse. So I didn't mention this, but ruxolitinib does not improve the cytopenias. So anemia does not improve. Uh, thrombocytopenia, if anything, will, tends to get worse over time with treatment with ruxolitinib. So this, is, this can become a problem eventually, even though they initially have a very good response to ruxolitinib. So, you know, what to do now? So there are other uh, JAK inhibitors that can be considered, and I'm not going to go into detail for, for the sake of time today, but there are um, differences with the uh, other uh, drugs in this class that might make them useful and, and some data to indicate that the use of, for instance, fedradinib, which is another recently approved JAK inhibitor, has some degree of efficacy uh, after patients have been treated with ruxolitinib. Uh, another example, mobilotinib, another drug in this class, uh, actually does lead to some degree of anemia improvement. And interestingly, that is thought to be due to an off-target effect against ACVR1, which is involved in regulating hepcidin production. So in that case, the anemia benefit with momolotinib is thought to be mediated, um, at least in part, through modulation of hepcidin. But regardless of which JAK inhibitor we're talking about, these drugs as a class, again, do not seem to be capable of really putting patients in remission and modifying their underlying disease in a uh, substantial way. So this is a problem, uh, obviously, for this field. And uh, this is a question that my group has really been trying to tackle for a number of years now. So we've asked the question, well, why, why is this the case that these JAK inhibitors don't really seem to be capable of eradicating the underlying malignant clone? So I think to address this, we have, we have recognized that this JAK stat signaling cascade, this pathway that I'm showing here, obviously is a very simplified cartoon. And maybe we need to think more broadly at this signaling network. And we know that there are a lot of other signaling pathways that intersect with JAK stat signaling, cytokines, inflammatory cytokines that can stimulate these pathways. And when you perturb the system with a JAK inhibitor, this can cause everything to potentially become rewired. So we thought it was really crucial to understand what's going on with all these signaling pathways, ideally in actual patient cells. And that's something that's very hard to do with traditional biochemical approaches. So for that reason, we turn to mass cytometry or CYTOP. And this is a technology that essentially uh, allows one to measure more than 40 parameters using antibodies conjugated to metal isotope reporters. Uh, and, and and evaluate cells at the single cell level. So this is, gave, gave us a way to look at blood or bone marrow samples from patients with myeloproliferative neoplasms and look at many of these different signaling pathways simultaneously. So just to um, uh, reiterate that, it, in this diagram, every uh, protein that's, has, that's outlined in white is one for which we have validated antibodies that can be used for this approach. And uh, importantly, we can also identify different distinct cell populations because we're doing this at the single cell level. And we inc can include markers that distinguish these different cell populations, such as the stem and progenitor compartments, as well as the mature myeloid compartments, which as I'll get into in just a little bit, we think are very relevant to the disease biology.
So in some of our earliest work with this approach, we just broadly surveyed intracellular signaling patterns in patients with myelofibrosis and secondary AML post-MPN. And what we found is that, as expected, there was some degree of jack stat activation observed. This was in uh, CD34 positive stemoprogenitor cells, as well as activation of other pathways like MAP kinase and PA3 kinase. But what's somewhat unexpected was that we saw evidence of dysregulation of the nf B pathway. And this is a pathway that hadn't really been implicated in MPNs up, up till now. And so looking more closely at this, we found that levels of phospho-P65 rel-A were uh, elevated in patients with myelofibrosis compared to normal controls. And this was seen both basally as well as following stimulation with TNF-alpha. Here's a, two examples in myelofibrosis and two patients with secondary AML. And we corroborated these findings looking at gene expression analysis. Here we did GSEA on a published gene expression data set to indicate that there was enrichment of nf kappa b pathway gene expression in MF-CD34 stem and progenitor cells. And then we looked at the impact of JAK2 inhibition with ruxolitinib on this nf kappa b hyperactivation. And what we found was that ruxolitinib actually was really not very effective at ameliorating this nf kappa b activation, suggesting that the lack of more complete response to JAK2 inhibition could at least be in part mediated by this abnormal nf kappa b activity. And furthermore, with the CYTOF approach, we can look at, you know, at all these different cell populations. So we could look at the entire landscape of cells in an individual patient. And here in this example, in a patient with myelofibrosis, we're, uh, I'm, I'm highlighting the T cells. And uh, you know, these are lymphoid cells, so they don't harbor JAK2 typically, or other uh, uh, mutations typically found in MPNs. And despite that, we do see evidence of abnormal nf kappa B activation. Uh, indicating that this is likely occurring through a cell non-autonomous mechanism. And even in the setting of, of in vivo exposure to ruxolitinib, that we still see abnormal nf kappa B activity. So just to illustrate this concept schematically, we, know, we think that the nf kappa B pathway can be activated through multiple mechanisms. So in a cell autonomous fashion, within an individual cell, jack stat signaling could lead to crosstalk and activation of nf kappa B but it also could lead to uh, upregulation of production of TNF, which could then act on a neighboring or downstream cell to activate nf kappa B. So for that reason, we look more closely at TNF and other inflammatory cytokines. And here looking at circulating plasma cytokines, what we found was that TNF was significantly elevated compared to normal. This has been shown in, many, in several other studies as well. But more importantly, as we found that patients treated with ruxolitinib, TNF levels remained abnormally high. So there was, there was this sort of a, a, I think, misconception in the field that, that ruxolitinib and other JAK inhibitors really are potent anti-inflammatory agents. And they are to some extent, but TNF as a, a key inflammatory cytokine really did not go anywhere, not down anywhere close to normal with ruxolitinib treatment. And when we look more broadly at a, at a, a large array of cytokines, we found this, a similar theme that many of these cytokines did not actually uh, return to normal levels with ruxolitinib treatment. Now, this is looking at circulating levels of these cytokines. We wanted to understand what are the actual cell populations that are producing these cytokines. And so we use the CYTOF approach to look at this and uh, identify different cell populations and in conjunction with their the production of individual cytokines. And here in this example, uh, this is highlighting CD14 positive monocytes from a patient with myelofibrosis, and that TNF was predominantly coming from a subset of these monocytes. Most of the cytokines we examined, their primary source was monocytes, which is an important point as far as, you know, these cytokines, which are likely uh, involved in the, M in the MPN disease development, are coming from these mature cells rather than the stem and progenitor cells. But, so these cells are likely to be relevant, again, for the disease biology. Uh, in some cases, the cytokines such as IL-8 we found were coming from CD34 positive progenitor cells. So again, uh, utilizing this approach, we could distinguish which, what are the different cell populations producing individual cytokines. So uh, to summarize a lot of work, we, we looked at all these individual cytokines and, and the, the po cell populations producing them, and their response to different stimuli or uh, inhibition with, of JAK2 with ruxolitinib. And what we found is that there seemed to be this group of cytokines, uh, which you know, could perhaps be considered the bad actors, which are insensitive to JAK2 inhibition with ruxolitinib. And that includes TNF, as well as IL-6 and IL-8. And so again, these, these might be the core cytokines that are really important uh, and mediating the, or you know, responsible for the lack of more significant response to JAK2 inhibition. So to drill down this further, 
knowing that TNF activates NF-CoV-B and then turn NF-CoV-B is a master regulator of production of these inflammatory cytokines. We looked at ways that we could target the NF-CoV-B pathway. And uh, after exploring a number of different approaches, we landed on this drug called pevanetostat. And pevanetostat is a NED8 activating enzyme inhibitor. And what this does, amongst other things, is result in accumulation of ICAVA-B alpha, which is a negative regulator of uh, NF-CAVA-B. So this leads to inhibition of NF-CAVA-B activity overall. So uh, we looked first at the impact of pemonetostat on production of these inflammatory cytokines such as TNF. And what we found was that this, uh, here it's looking at the, the cells positive for TNF. And, and uh, as you can see here with, with ruxolitinib, there's really not uh, much of an effect. However, pevanetostat quite potently blocks the production of TNF compared to ruxolitinib. So much more effective than ruxolitinib. Here's, that's an example of TNF. Here's an example with IL-6, where you can see that the majority of the cells remain positive for TNF or IL-6 in the presence of ruxolitinib, but um, a much more uh, substantial effect with pevanetostat. So uh, pevanetostat, again, does many things. So we want to confirm that it does indeed inhibit NF-CABA B signaling uh, in the relevant cells here, looking at a, 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 the HEL cell line, which harbors the jak 2 v 617 f mutation. And we found that it does block TNF-induced activation of NF-CABA B. And uh, in proliferation assays with this HEL cell line, we found that there was a combinatorial effect of pevanetostat plus ruxolitinib. We also looked directly at, at MF patient cells. So this is CD34 positive cells from patients with myelofibrosis. And uh, we looked at a, an, a, you know, a similar array of, of signaling markers that we utilized in our prior studies. And we found that the predominant effect of pemonetostat that really is in blocking nf kappa b signaling. That's shown in this heat map as well as summarized here uh, in terms of uh, uh, inhibiting uh, phospho p65 as well as uh, i kappa b alpha. And we also corroborated this by looking at expression of nf kappa b gene targets and confirmed that and induction of these genes in response to TNF was also blocked by pevanetostat. Um, we have additionally have conducted uh, colony assays to look at the effect of pevanetostat on MPN patient cells uh, in culture. And what we have observed is that in, in MF patients, pevanetostat um, led to a dose dependent inhibition of colony formation and a selective effect on MF versus normal CD4, 30, CD34 cell colony formation. So this suggests there might be a therapeutic window with pevanetostat to selectively target MPN patient cells. Uh, also in a small number of uh, uh, samples, we did see some evidence of a uh, additive effect with pevanetostat plus ruxolitinib. So with, with these studies in mind, we have been able to take this back to the clinic and have initiated a clinical trial for patients with myelofibrosis using this drug, pevanetostat. So this is a phase one uh, dose escalation study in which we are taking patients with myelofibrosis who have been on treatment with ruxolitinib for at least three months. And the idea here is that they've at least achieved a stable response to ruxolitinib. And then we add in pevanetostat. So we've done this in, in a dose escalation fashion, and the study is currently ongoing. We've, we're just entering level three, uh, and I can tell you that uh, we've had no DLTs thus far. So at least from a safety standpoint, that's been encouraging. And, and you know, again, this is a phase one study, but you know, we're hoping to see some hint of efficacy in this early phase study. So uh, certainly very exciting for us to be taking these observations from the laboratory and move that into the clinic. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, uh, change gears a little bit now and, and come back to the genetic basis of these diseases. So I told you about JAK2, MIPO, and CalR mutations as being the primary drivers of these diseases. But we know that, in fact, many patients with MPNs have secondary mutations. And in fact, in, these, in this study where, where about 40 patients each with PV, ET, and myelofibrosis underwent exome sequencing, uh, you can see that some patients had only one or two uh, driver mutations, but in many cases, there were five, five to 10. So in myelofibrosis, the average was 13 mutations. And some of these are likely passenger mutations, which are not uh, actually relevant to the disease pathogenesis. But we know that, again, in many of these patients, there are likely cooperating driver, uh, secondary driver mutations. And that's been borne out in some of these studies looking at genomic complexity and prognosis, particularly in myelofibrosis. And um, these are some of the common 
secondary mutations that are found in myelofibrosis. And in terms of prognosis, uh, okay, so we, we, it's been established now that there's this uh, mutationally high-risk signature involving mutations in one of uh, these genes, ESH, EZH2, ASXR1, SRSF2, or IDH1 or 2. So the presence of any one of these mutations uh, puts patients into a higher risk category where overall survival is significantly worse and the likelihood of transformation to acute leukemia is higher. Furthermore, uh, more mutations are bad, so two or more of these mutations also is worse compared to one or none. So let's take that back to our patient and say, well, let's say he underwent some, sort, some form of NGS clinical testing, uh, which revealed mutations in asx one and SRSF2, two of those high-risk mutations. How does this impact his prognosis? And you know, keep in mind, in, in what I described, he was put on ruxolitinib and did well for about 18 months and then showed evidence of disease progression. So there have been a, a whole host of prognostic prognostication schemes that have been developed for myelofibrosis. And this is one of the most recent iterations, which takes into account uh, these different high molecular risk mutations. So if you put in all of the different clinical variables, which are known to be uh, important prognostic factors, such as anemia, um, increased blast count in the peripheral blood, and so on and so forth. Uh, also, we know that CalR mutations are associated with more favorable prognosis. Um, so that's in our in the patient I described, that's good. However, that's sort of negated by the presence of these high molecular risk mutations. So with all that in mind, if you put these in, into this uh, calculator, what comes out is he, he falls into this very high risk category with a median survival of only 1.8 years. So not only does that sort of fit in some ways with, with the evolution of the case that I described, but it also tells you that his prognosis is obviously quite poor. So we have been also trying to tackle this in the laboratory to understand how different secondary mutations cooperate with JAK2 to drive NPN pathogenesis and uh, focusing uh, uh, in part on ASX01, which is one of the mo more common secondary mutations and also is commonly found in conjunction with JAK2 in patients with myelofibrosis. And this is, again, just illustrating that ASX01 does have this negative impact in terms of prognosis. So for this project, we have focused on trying to model this disease in human cells, knowing that uh, mouse models in general do not necessarily recapitulate the full disease spectrum, but in particular with ASX01, with the nature of the mutations being that they do not necessarily result in a complete loss of function. So knockout models are not necessarily the best way to approach this. We, we said, well, why don't we focus on actual human cells that harbor these specific uh, patient-derived mutations. And so uh, what we've done is we've utilized a pluripotent stem cell system where we take ES cells. Uh, and the advantage of this is ES cells uh, can be grown indefinitely in culture, and they also can be manip manipulated to differentiate them into any hematopoietic lineage. So with these ES cell lines, we can then introduce specific mutations via CRISPR in any combination. So for example, in, in, in this project, we have focused on JAK2 and ASX01 and a specific mutation that was found in a particular patient. And then by CRISPR, put in every combination of this of JAK2 and ASX01 mutations so that we generate four distinct genotyped lines. So with this approach, we have uh, we can take these ES lines, we can differentiate them into CD34 positive hematopoietic progenitors, and then put them into methylcellulose to do colony assays. And what we've observed is that uh, JAK2, as expected, does result in uh, an increase in colony formation overall, as well as specifically in an, uh, an increase in erythroid colony formation. And you can see here in this example, even the individual colonies are much bigger in, in, in the cells harboring JAK2v 617 f In contrast with asx one expression, we see a decrease overall in colony formation and a skewing so that there are virtually no erythroid colonies, so, uh, as well as you know, an enrichment of myeloid colonies. So uh, a very distinct phenotype, difference in phenotype compared to JAK2. And the double knock-in, we see somewhat of an intermediate effect, suggesting that uh, the expression of both JAK2 and ASX1, essentially, essentially this uh, impairment of erythroid formation, which you can uh, sort of equate to the anemia that we see in patients, it's not fully corrected in the presence of both JAK2 and ASX01. So we have taken these lines, taken the CD34 positive progenitors, and we've done RNA-seq uh, 
and our analysis is still ongoing, but we identified some interesting targets which we're going to uh, uh, interrogate both pharmacologically and genetically with the idea that, you know, focusing on pathways and inhibitors that we might actually be able to translate to the clinic. So we view this as a very uh, uh, high yield approach to, again, uh, pursue ideas that can be uh, moved back into the clinic. Okay, and I'll just show here that we've done similar uh, colony assays using actual MPN patient cells and patients harboring either JAK2 or asx one in combination with JAK2, and we see a very similar phenotype in terms of this impairment of erythroid colony formation. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, change gears again now and uh, show you two cases of polycythemia vera. So first on the left here, we have a young woman, 34 years old. She presents with Bud Chiari syndrome and she has no past medical history and her CBC shows just a mild erythrocytosis. This actually might even be in, within the normal range, but it's actually just above the cutoff, which is 16 for uh, the diagnostic criteria for polycythemia vera. And she's found to be positive for the JAK2 mutation. Her mutant allele burden is actually very low, about 7%. Now, it, you know, for our, your uh, medicine house staff, you probably have seen patients like this. It's not that uncommon uh, in a patient with Bud Chiari or some other splanchnic vein thrombosis. Uh, even with relatively normal counts, the JAK2 mutation can be found as long as there's no underlying cirrhosis or other uh, obvious etiology in up to 50% of patients who present like this. Now on the right is another example. This is a more sort of typical case of polycythemia vera. An older gentleman who presents for routine evaluation, he feels well but does note this, uh, what we call aquagenic pruritus, it's exacerbated by hot showers. Um, as an aside, this, this particular symptom can be, in some cases, debilitating in its severity. Um, but his CBC shows elevation in all three lines, markedly elevated hemoglobin, a mild leukocytosis, and thrombocytosis. And he's also JAK2 positive, but with a much higher JAK2 allele burden. So you have quite the stark uh, difference in uh, the presentation of these two cases. And what, what explains that? So, um, I just m mentioned also that uh, one, of, one of our former medicine residents, Joan Howe, worked with me on a project looking at these patients with splanchnic vein thrombosis and uh, those that had both a concomitant MPN and splanchnic vein thrombosis which is versus those that with an MPN without splanchnic vein thrombosis. And what we found, amongst other things, was that the JAK2 mutant aloburn was almost universally low in these patients with associated splanchnic vein thrombosis. And that connects with uh, a prior study uh, from some colleagues uh, at Chica in Chicago, uh, as well as at Johns Hopkins, where they, they looked at patients in different age brackets with polycythemia vera. So younger patients, less than 45, and, and the key is young at diagnosis versus older patients at diagnosis. So, so again, this is not patients in this category who were diagnosed at age 45 and then were um, examined 20 years later, but at rather the age at diagnosis. And in the younger group, uh, it was overwhelmingly female and uh, lower JAK2 allele burden compared to the older group and a higher um, incidence of splanchnic vein thrombosis. So all of these features, anecdotally, I, you know, I, you know, was quite clear that this is the case in these younger patients compared to the older patients, but validated in this study. And we are interested in understanding, you know, is there a genetic basis that distinguishes these patients who have a somewhat distinct clinical profile um, and, and again, is there some genetic basis for this? So this was in part based on prior studies uh, from colleagues here at WashU, Tim Lay, Dan Link, John Welch, who established that uh, acquisition of mutations is a normal function of aging. So as, as individuals age, this is the case of uh, AML, we see that there's an, a predictable increase in the overall number of somatic mutations. And, and then even in normals, we see that this increases over time. So again, it's, a, it's a, kind of a normal function of aging. And we, we figured that in the younger patients, there's probably a lower number of mutations than the older patients uh, compared to the older patients. Perhaps that explains this clinical uh, phenotype distinction. So to address this, we assembled a cohort of uh, young patients with PV and old patients with PV. It's not that easy to find these younger ones. So we are, our, our sample set is relatively small, but we have about 10 patients in each group. And I should mention, this is work that was supported by uh, our grant from the Longer Life Foundation. So um, as expected, we found that in the young group, it was a uh, majority of the patients were female, 
and that there was a high incidence of splanchnic vein thrombosis. Um, we supplemented this group of 10, uh, 10 or so patients that we sequenced with an additional almost 10 patients in each group uh, for some of the uh, additional studies that I'll show you in just a second. Now, looking at JAK2 a little burden in these two groups, when we just looked at the first uh, smaller group of patients that we sequenced, we did not find a statistically significant difference in the JAK2 a little burden. However, when we added in additional patients with clinical data, we found that there was, as expected, a, a lower JAK2 a little burden in the young versus the old. But perhaps more importantly is that when we looked at the overall number of mutations uh, by exome sequencing, we found that there was, as predicted, an increased number of mutations, about 10, in the older group compared with three in the young group. And again, I'll, I'll just reiterate that in our study, we did focus on patients who were um, taken close to diagnosis, so either young at diagnosis or older diagnosis, not those that had been diagnosed at a particular age and then followed for, for a long time before they were studied. Uh, now, looking beyond the JAG2 mutation, all these patients were JAG2 mutant as expected. There was a very stark difference in the uh, number or presence of other uh, cooperating mutations. So we, we filtered this data down to those that were uh, known to be recurrent mutations in MPNs, and so likely cooperating pathogenic mutations. And we found that in the young group, none of the patients had a secondary mutation. It was JAG2 only. However, in the old group, with the exception of one patient, there was at least one or more secondary mutations. Now, again, you could hypothesize that this is all about um, aging and the older patients acquire these mutations over time, and that's why we see them. And if that's the case, we would perhaps predict that these aging-related mutations would be acquired prior to JAK2 through the course of normal aging. And then as soon as they acquire JAK2 on top of that, that's when they present with polycythemia vera. So if that's the case, we should be able to see this in terms of the uh, mutation order of a mutation acquisition reflected in the mutation allele frequencies. Uh, this is inferred when you look at the numbers, but uh, you can predict that in these cases where we're looking at JAG2 and blue, if, if the uh, second mutation is a higher allele frequency, it would suggest that it was indeed acquired before JAG2. But in other cases where the allele frequencies might be similar, or uh, it would suggest that perhaps they were required, acquired concomitantly with JAG2. Or in the case where the JAK2 mutation is higher allele frequency, it would suggest that the second mutation was acquired, in fact, after JAK2. Now, this is all inferred, so you can verify this using uh, by, by genotyping individual colonies from these patients. And we did that in a select number of cases. And the long story short is that we found essentially every pattern was possible. In this case, it wasn't entirely definitive because of the low number of colonies, which exact route was the case. But the, but the take home point is that. Uh, these mutations can be, these secondary mutations can be acquired either before, coincident with, or after JAG2. It's not one predominant pattern and suggests that there's actually a, perhaps a, a more complicated relationship between the secondary mutations and PV disease in, initiation, as well as the interaction with aging. So for that reason, we looked at other aspects of these cases, and we, we hypothesized that, well, in these young patients, you know, why, why do they develop PV at a young age? How is that possible? Maybe they have some baseline abnormal inflammation that uh, you know either allows for uh, you know when, when the JAK2 mutation occurs for, to allow clonal expansion, or you know somehow promote uh, development of JAK2 mutation. And so for that reason, we looked at these inflammatory cytokines again, expecting that in the young patients we might see this baseline abnormal inflammation. So we compared the young patients to matched young normals, and we found that yes, there was a, a significant uh, uh, abnormal uh, cytokine profile. But when we looked similarly at the old patients next to old matched controls, we actually found a very similar pattern. So it wasn't really the case uh, that the young patients had more significant inflammation to begin with. And this is displayed in a, in a different way where we, we normalized to the, the age matched controls and then looked at the relative degree of abnormal cytokine production. What we found is actually, if anything, the older patients had even more exacerbated inflammatory cytokine production. And this could be due to the, those secondary mutations, which we know, which, you know, in the, in the literature, it's been established now that many of these secondary driver mutations actually do in, by themselves result in abnormal inflammation. So this suggests there's actually, again, a more complicated role between or interaction between age, uh, these secondary mutations and this inflammatory cytokine milieu. Okay, so I am going to um, stop here and leave time for questions. I, I want to make sure that I acknowledge uh, 
all the people in my lab that have contributed to this work over the years, including our most recent, our newest member, Kevin Shim, who is an internal, second year internal medicine resident, and is just beginning his three month research block. Uh, my clinical team really is, has been uh, uh, instrumental in, in the care of our MPAN patients, as well as uh, uh, carrying out a, a broad array of clinical trials, which I didn't really go into detail, but including the Pevanetostat study that I described. Our CYTOF work uh, is facilitated by the Immunomonitoring Lab, which is part of the Bursky Center for Human Immunology and Immunotherapy Programs. This is where our CYTOF instruments are located. And um, I'm involved in a number of collaborative, collaborative studies, which I, again, didn't really have time to get into today, but just want to mention, uh, we've been collaborating with Grant Challen and Hamza Chelik, who have developed a really nice xenotransplant system. So now we can take primary MPN cells and, and transplant these into immunocompromised mice. And uh, again, it gives us another way to directly study MPN patient cells, but in vivo. Uh, so that's a very powerful system that they've developed. Um, Luis Batiste and Chris Sturgeon have been really critical for the pluripotent stem cell modeling that we've developed. And uh, a, we've developed a new collaboration with Jorge de Paula, um, which is, I think, a really exciting project focusing on platelets, specifically NAMPANs, which we think do a lot of things in this disease. And we hope to uh, understand those with the studies that we're carrying out. And then finally, um, we, I've been collaborating with Dan Link and Carrie Etchen to develop uh, an adaptation of the CYTOF approach, which is uh, imaging mass cytometry, in which we can uh, apply that same uh, metal tagged antibody approach, but now on tissue sections. And I'll just give you a little teaser for maybe the next time I, I talk to show that we can use this approach to stain uh, bone marrow sections. And, and now we can, we can, with the same multiplex 40 parameter approach, we can characterize bone marrow biopsies from patients with MPNs in a way that's never been done before. And this is particularly convenient and exciting because we can do this on archived core bone marrow biopsy specimens, which are obtained through re routine clinical diagnostics. So we have uh, archives and, and pathology that go back, you know, even more than 10 years ago where we can retrieve these specimens for this kind of analysis. And then last but not least, I want to thank my funding sources uh, who have allowed us to do this work. And uh, in particular, the Longer Life Foundation, who again supported the, the polycythemia vera studies that I described and, uh, and sponsored this talk. So, so thanks very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. O, for that wonderful presentation. We do have a couple of questions that have come into the Q&A. Um, feel free to submit more questions as we go about this as well to all the attendees out there. Um, one question that came up here, does biopsy quality impact the estimates of mutation prevalence for the patients with PV? So uh, if, if, if you're referring to biopsy quality, so, so you know, there, I guess one, one, one aspect you might be thinking of is in patients with myelofibrosis, we do not get a good quality bone marrow aspirin. That's expected because of the fibrosis in the bone marrow. So when you're sampling uh, the bone marrow, and, and you know, we know this clinically, if you're looking at the aspirate, what you're actually looking at primarily is contaminated peripheral blood. So that does confound the analysis to some extent. Now, again, core biopsies are still useful, um, both clinically and for research, research purposes. So, um, so that can, you know, can nonetheless be helpful. As far as mutation prevalence, there, there is, you know, overall, we think of, for instance, if you, if you look at peripheral blood versus bone marrow, that the mutation prevalence of JAG2 or these other mutations is, is by and large in the same ballpark, but there definitely can be differences. And, and there's certainly some literature um, indicating that if you look, for instance, in the stem of progenitor cells versus mature cells, you can certainly find differences. So that could be relevant to the disease biology, but on a clinical level, again, we, we, re, we re, relatively speaking, would consider peripheral blood and bone marrow to be uh, similar. Great. Um, and here's another question here. You have shown that there are multiple genes involved in MPNs, and these other mutations have prognostication power. Can you discuss the possible role can comprehensive cancer genomic profiling could play in patients with MPNs in clinical practice? Yeah, that, that's an important question. I didn't really get it specifically get into that too much. So, uh, the, you know, we, we certainly know from, from what I just showed and, and, uh, and many other studies that this kind of extensive genetic profiling can be helpful in refining prognostication. Um, but it, the, as far as its utility, uh, and, you know, of and of course, providing that kind of information is very useful clinically. Uh, but 
as far as whether that you know impacts choice of treatment otherwise you know the really at, the, at this time the main utility is goes to the question of transplantation i didn't really get into that too much detail but um, if if a patient is found to be at particularly high risk because of their genetic profile and the other clinical features, then that would potentially, uh, you know, argue for more likely to proceed to transplantation. And one of the reasons I didn't um, get into that into more details is that the reality is that the majority of patients with uh, myelofibrosis, for example, are not eligible for transplant simply because of age or and or other comorbidities. But if you have a patient, say, is in, in their 50s, um, who has these high risk mutations? That would definitely be a strong uh, consideration, uh, in part because of those that genetic profile. And the other corollary to this, of course, is that with the JAK inhibitors and the current status of the field, we don't really have other options for treatments that we that are capable of inducing long term disease free remission at this time. We hope for that to change very soon, but transplant is really the way to go if you're if you have that kind of high risk profile and a patient is eligible. That's great. And that kind of really stepped into the other question here, too. The last question was about the role of transplant at any time in the disease course, um, and then specifically talking about whether this would be after treatment with raloxetinib or the pevanidostat. So I think you kind of touched upon that already. I'm not seeing any other questions come in at this time. Um, we're just about seven to the hour here. If people have further questions, we can stick around for a little bit longer. Um, but I'd like to take this time again to thank Dr. O as well as the Longer Life Foundation for being here with us for Grand Rounds this morning. Um, it's, it was great to discuss this, this in great depth today. Um, and I appreciate the time that you took to, to make this happen. All right, thank you.